Okay, so we are back again, and we had a question. Would you like to ask your question? When I was reading the um, Life of Bass argument about sexuality, it made me think of Foucault's arguments about sexuality and the nature of sexual discourse. And I was just wondering if that was a correct parallel to make, because a lot of the same ideas seem to come up. Mm -hmm. That is a very, very, very good question. Uh, how many of you here have heard of Foucault? Michel Foucault? Well, a fair number of people have, yeah. Michel Foucault uh, was a uh, very prominent French philosopher and historian of the, uh, oh, the middle to late uh, 20th century. He died in the, uh, in the 1980s, as I recall and uh, has been extremely influential with a lot of his ideas. And one of his major works is a multi-volume work called The History of Sexuality. And in that, he makes the argument, I mean, it's much more complicated than this, but, but put briefly enough, he makes the argument that uh, the arguments about sexuality really form a kind of discourse of power. In other words, that the discourse about sexuality in our culture has often functioned as a discourse of power, and who has power and who does not have power within the culture. So is that basically what you had in mind? And of course, that's what she is talking about. I mean, she's not a philosopher. She's not a theoretician in the same way that Foucault is. She doesn't live in the 20th century. Uh, but nevertheless, we can take sometimes the insights of a modern thinker and reread an older text and get a whole new view of it. That's what we frequently do. For example, not only in the case of Foucault, but also in the case of your working on women writers, almost inevitably, you're going to be running into some feminist thinkers and the thinking that they're engaged in as they look at women writers as well as men writers. And uh, so what you have in many cases will be a contemporary of ours developing certain theories or certain ideas and applying these to a woman writer of, let's say, the distant past. So, uh, I mean, I was talking to one student during the break here where we were talking about the possibility of her writing a paper on Marjorie Kemp. And uh, Marjorie Kemp is a very interesting late medieval woman who claimed to have mystical experiences. And uh, so we have, by the way, her account of her life. She apparently was not literate, but she dictated this to uh, the person who wrote it all down. And uh, it is in that form, evidently, that it has come down to us. Well, that's very interesting. And notice also uh, another question comes out of that, that we have a selection from Marjorie Kemp's work here in our anthology, but it's a pretty short selection. It's only about 12 pages. And uh, her text is probably about 150 or 160 pages in an average size book. So in many of the cases that you might be undertaking with your own writer, you may not be able to find the work or the whole work in our anthology. And so you would need to go to something beyond our anthology. Just be careful always to cite your sources. OK? So that's a very good question about Foucault. Thank you. And feel free to bring up things like that, you know, as we're going along. Uh, this is not just a monologue, you know, with me doing all of the talking. But uh, please join in. OK, so. We get towards the end of the Wife of Bass prologue. And we have a long section in which she talks about marrying husband number five, who is apparently considerably younger than she. So now you'll notice that the tables have turned. Whereas in the case of her first three marriages, 
she was the younger one, and then her husbands were a good deal older. And she used sex, talk about sex and power, she used sex as a way of manipulating them and getting control over them. Now, notice things are reversed. She's older, she's not old, but she's older and apparently considerably older than husband number five is by perhaps as much as 20 years. And so he is going around, his name is Jenkin, by the way, And he is something of a scholar, and he is constantly reading to her from his book of Wicked Wives. which is actually a collection of various texts that are anti-feminist and therefore attacks on women. Now, there was a tradition, and it's particularly associated with the ascetic tradition that I was talking about a little bit earlier in our last segment, associated with, not just with Jerome, I'm not trying to pick on Jerome, but people like Jerome, and Jerome was a, a spokesman in the early church for this kind of thinking. Uh, Jerome was replying to a guy who had written a, uh, a work in which he said, you know, marriage is really a great institution. Uh, he's a man now. Marriage is really a great institution and women are really terrific and, and uh, you know, sexuality and marriage is great and so forth. And Jerome took this apparently as some kind of threat to himself and the way of life that he was proposing. And so he wrote this horrifying but rhetorically brilliant attack on, uh, not exactly an attack on marriage, that would be misstating the point, but, but his point really is that holy virginity is the highest form of Christian life. And uh, that uh, this Jovinian guy, you know, who had written celebrating marriage, why well, he had it all wrong. And whatever Jerome's intentions may have been, certainly we can go into his work and find all kinds of anti-feminist statements. And there was a tradition of anti-Semitism, uh, anti-feminism, anti uh, well there was of anti-Semitism too, but of anti-feminism uh, in, uh, in the Middle Ages and of course well beyond the Middle Ages. Uh, there was a wonderful book done on this a number of years ago by a guy named Francis Lee Utley who was a folklorist as well as a medievalist called The Crooked Rib, The Crooked Rib. You know how in the biblical story Eve is created out of the rib of Adam? Well, Utley entitled his book The Crooked Rib and it's a study of anti-feminism in the Middle Ages. And uh, so here is Jenkin with his book of wicked wives going back to, oh, the old saw, for example, that it was through Eve that Adam fell. Why, if it hadn't been for Eve seducing Adam, uh, everything would be okay with the human family. We never would have undergone the fall. We never would have had to suffer the way we have as a consequence of that original sin. It's all a result of Eve. And women, after all, are daughters of Eve. And then, you know, people would go down through a long recounting of how men have been brought down low by this woman or that woman or another woman and so forth. And that's what the, the Book of Wicked Wives here consists of, a series of such stories. Well, once again, notice as Foucault, thank you very much, as Foucault pointed out, here the discourse right, the language, the discourse, the discussion, the discourse, as we nowadays say, 
about women in relation to men and sexuality is really about power, right? Because the anti-feminist tradition was really, in a way, an effort to establish power over women and to control women and to control their sexuality. So, uh, you know, once again, we come back to a modern theorist who can give us some very articulate insight into this problem and, and in effect can provide us to a certain extent with a vocabulary for even talking about the problem. So, uh, that's what he's doing. And he reads to her constantly from uh, his book of Wicked Wives and he knows that he's infuriating her. His whole point is to anger her. Now, maybe he's just doing this kidding around to a certain extent at any rate. But finally, she gets so mad that she gets up and she tore, t tears a leaf out of his book and she throws it into the fire. Well, books were difficult to come by in the Middle Ages. Remember that they had to be painstakingly copied out by hand. And it would take one person or sometimes teams of people a long time to copy manuscripts and to say nothing of manuscript books that were called codices. And so this is something very valuable that she is destroying. Well, he retrieves this from the, you know, he's got the book, the, the book itself, and he retrieves this and he hits her across the side of the head with it. She falls down and she's dazed. She's not unconscious, but she is dazed. And being so smart and quick-witted as she is, she thinks, aha, here's my big chance. And so she pretends that she's dying as a result of the blow that he has given her. And by the way, that, that blow on the side of her head, that's what's made her somewhat deaf. Remember back in the general prologue description, she was sumdale deaf. That's what made her deaf, or somewhat deaf. Not, she's not totally deaf. And uh, so she's lying there groaning, and he's up over and saying, oh my god, what have I done? Oh, this is so terrible. I love you. Uh, you know, I, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Please don't die on me. And uh, so she says, oh, well, you know, maybe I'll survive. I'll try. And uh, so he keeps begging her and weeping over her and so forth. I've never done anything like this in my life. I just got carried away. I'm so sorry. I'll never do this again, you know, and so on and so on. So she, she lets him go on for a while. And he says, I'll do anything. I'll do anything you want. You know, just please come back to me. Don't, don't die. Just come back to me. Uh, and, of course, what he has done is yield to her the mastery in marriage. And so from that point on, she says, we were ecstatically happy. Because what, after all, makes a marriage happy? Why? When the woman has the mastery. And the only time that they were having difficulty was when he was trying to have the mastery over her. So. Then she proceeds to tell a tale. And let's go to the PowerPoint, please, Scott. Let me just briefly suggest to you what the plot of The Wife of Bass Tale is. <clears throat> the crisis occurs at the beginning of it. This is an Arthurian romance, very short Arthurian romance, but nevertheless an Arthurian romance. We're going to talk more about Arthurian romance when we get to our next segment in the course in which we have a knight who is guilty of the crime of rape. And he rapes a, a young peasant girl. We don't know that this was common, but it was apparently talked about at any rate to the extent that there actually 
was a literary form in Old French and Middle French literature which was devoted to poetry about a knight who rapes a young peasant girl. Now that doesn't mean that it was a common social practice, but it was something at any rate that got talked about in the literature. But in this case, it's taken very, very seriously. And so the knight is going to be condemned to death. This is on the order of King Arthur, who is presiding over his court. Well, Guinevere and the other ladies of the court say, oh, no, 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 please, 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 please. You know, he's such a sweet young man, and he's really such an innocent. Uh, surely he didn't really mean all of that and didn't know what he was doing, and so on and so on. And uh, don't be so harsh with him as to have him executed. And so Arthur finally says, OK, I'll tell you what. You women decide what the appropriate punishment should be for him. You judge him. And after all, the original crime was a crime against women, a woman, but in a sense against women, right? And so it is appropriate then for women to be the judges and for women to decide what the punishment will be. So they come up with a form of trial in which he is going to have to go on a quest. Now, romances constantly involve quests. Knights are sent out on quests of one kind or another. Well, in this case, the quest is going to be to answer the question, what is it that women want most? What is it that women want most? Now remember, it's the wife of Bath who's telling this tale, by the way. And so he's given a year. And he can go off all around the world, if he wishes, to try to find the correct answer to the question. But he's got to return at the end of a year, by honor bound. And if he doesn't have the right answer, he's going to be executed. So he goes off and he goes around from one country to another country to another country and he asks women, what is it that women want most? And the problem is he's getting too many different answers. Some women say money. Some women say sex. Some women say fine clothes. Some women say a wonderful family and lots of children. Uh, you know, it, some say security. I mean, there are all kinds of different things that different women say that that's what women want most. So he's coming back home because remember at the end of a year he is honor bound to return. He's coming back home and he's all dejected because he doesn't know the answer. And so he meets an old woman along the way. And she is described as the loathly hag. Well, who knows what that really means. But in any event, she's supposed to be very old and very uh, physically unattractive. And so she says, well, now, Sir Knight, what's, what's the matter? Why are you so downcast? And so he tells her his story. And she says, well, I can give you the correct answer, but you, in return, have to do something for me. And he says, anything you ask. And she says, anything? And he says, yes, anything you ask. Remember now that if he doesn't have the right answer, he's going to be executed. Now, this is what is frequently called, particularly in folklore studies, the rash boon, the rash boon. Did you get that off the PowerPoint? The rash boon. Um, OK, it's right here. Am I able to point to that? I guess I'm not. But anyway, the rash boon. What that means is that a boon is granting somebody his or her wish. OK? 
Well, what if you grant somebody their wish rashly, not knowing what it is, and then when you find out what it is that the person is asking, you're not real happy about that at all? Well, that happens a lot of the time in the romances. So she tells him the answer. He goes back to the court, appears before the court of the, of the women, and they say, well, Sir Knight, have you learned the answer to the question? What is it that women want more than anything else? And he says, the correct answer is mastery over their men. Mastery over their husbands or boyfriends or whatever. Mastery over their men. That's what women want most. And the women all look at one another and kind of go, whoa, well, gee, you know, he's right. He's right. That is what we want most, more than anything else. And so uh, they let him off. And they're going to have this big party now as a celebration. He has fulfilled the quest. At which point, the old woman comes in and she says, uh, excuse me, Sir Knight, remember now that you promised to do anything I want? And he says, well, gulp, yes, that's true. And she says, marry me. And he says, uh, er, uh, er, uh, marry you? And she says, yes, marry me. Now remember that, that this isn't just an old woman. I mean, she's described as being way older than he is. And so we've got the reversal of the situation we had with the old husbands and the young wives in, in some of the earlier instances. So she, uh, she, she says, yes, you know, wait a minute. Am I not talking to a knight of Arthur's court? Are not the knights of Arthur's court true to their word? Well, yes, he says. Okay, okay, I'll marry you. But let's do it in secret. You know, because I don't want everybody to see that I'm marrying you. So uh, they get married. And then they go to the bridal bower presumably the site at which the marriage is going to be consummated. Uh, and so they go, because, and, and this is a technical point, which you may or may not know, but maybe not everybody here knows, uh, that the, the legal point of the consummation of a marriage, which is when the married couple actually have sexual intercourse, the, uh, the legal point is that if the marriage is not consummated, it's not a marriage. It's not a marriage. And therefore, it can be declared annulled by a court. Okay? There are people, and certainly in the Middle Ages, there were people who would actually go to court and they would uh, petition that their marriages be annulled on the grounds that they were never consummated. Now, it was difficult to make that case if there were any children. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but if there weren't any children, then sometimes, you know, if people had enough power and influence, they could actually get the, the, the ruling in their favor and have the marriage annulled. Well, any event, in any event, notice that's, that's really the point at issue here in a way, because what would normally happen here would be the, the consummation of the marriage. Well, what happens? The young knight hops into bed rolls over and pretends to go to sleep, at which point his new bride taps him on the shoulder and says, uh, excuse me, <laughs> Sir Knight, uh, is this the way the knights of Arthur's court behave toward their ladies? And of course, she shames him into rolling over and saying, okay, okay, okay. But you know, try to see this from my point of view. If, if you can. And uh, she says, let me tell you about gentilessa. Now, remember what I said uh, a couple of sessions ago about gentilessa? 
Let me write that again on the uh, on the board here on the tablet. Okay. Okay, we talked about this in connection with the, uh, with the knight who is described as a parfait, gentle, knight, and we've talked about it since then when we've talked about uh, who was gentle or gentil in French or not. She gives him a long lecture on gentilesse in which she talks about how people ought to behave toward one another and this is not simply men and women, but, but everybody. Everybody should behave in a way that is truly considerate towards others. And that's what gentilesse is. You don't hurt people's feelings. You try to be considerate and sympathetic of their feelings. You try to be helpful towards people rather than to lord it over them, and so on and so on and so on. And it's a, it's a brilliant exposition of this whole medieval concept of gentilesse. And you can find this not only elsewhere in Chaucer, but you can find it elsewhere in medieval literature. And it's been much discussed and, and studied as a consequence. OK, so at the end of this lengthy discussion, we get down to her saying, um, Let's see, I jumped ahead to the wrong page here. Um, so she, uh, she gets down to, um, a line say 12, Well, starting around 12, eight, or excuse me, 1183, she says, well, yes, I'm poor. I'm not only old, but I'm also poor. Don't reprove me for that. I mean, I can't help the fact that, that I am poor, just as I can't help the fact that I am old. And so in 1213 and following, she says, now, Sir, of Elda, that is to say of being old, you reprove me. You reprove me for being old. I mean, after all, who can, who can help being old? You know, I mean, it's just part of the natural, you know, process of life that we all get older. On certes here, though non autorite were in no book. Notice once again coming back to questions of authority, experience, and so on and so on. Your gentles of honor saying that men should an old week don favor and clap him father for your gentilesse and actors shall he fiend as he guess. Now, there you say that he am fool and old, then dread you not to be a cockawold. Remember we talked about what a cuckold is when we are talking about the Miller's Tale? This is an image that is used for a very, 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 very long time in European literature, not only English, but also European literature generally. Uh, often with the figure of the cuckoo, often with the figure, oddly enough, of the horns which are placed on the head of the husband whose wife is fooling around with somebody else. And so you have these two different images, one of the cuckoo bird and the other of the man who has the horns placed on his head by his wife, by the way, and his wife's lover. And uh, so, you know, one of the things, at least, look at the bright side, because I am as old and foul as you take me to be, that you don't have to worry about me fooling around with other guys. Okay? For filth and elda also mot e they, been great wardens upon chastite. Okay, these are guardians of chastity. 
But nevertheless, since he can know your delete, he shall fulfill your worldly appetite. Okay? Okay, but even so, I understand how you feel, and so I'm going to find a way of fulfilling your worldly appetite. So, she provides him with a kind of contest. Remember, there was a contest at the beginning where the women said to him, you know, if you want to save your life, here is the question you have to answer. He comes back and with the help of the old woman is able to give the correct answer. He saves himself. So also here, we have yet another kind of contest, don't we? She says, choose now. You can have me one way or you can have me the other way. But you have to make the choice. Chase now, quod she, on of these thingas tway, to han me full and old till that idea, and be to you a true humble weave, and never you displays in all me leave. Or Ellis, you will either take me as I am, and you can be sure that I will never be unfaithful to you, and as a matter of fact, I'll be a wonderful wife to you, and I will do everything that you ask me. Or else, you will han me young and fair, young and beautiful, and talk your aventure of the repair that shall be to your house because of me or in some other place, well, may be. What she's saying is, you can also choose for me to be young and, and beautiful. But if you choose that, you know, uh, I will not guarantee that I will stay with you or that I will be faithful to you. Okay? So now he has to choose. This knik to viseth him on sore seeketh, Sika's sighing here. He doesn't know what to do. Right? But at a last, he said in this manner, me laddie and me love and weave so dare, he put a may in your weave's governance. Chaseth yourself, which may be most pleasance and most honor to you, and may also. E do no force the weather of the two, for as you leaketh, it suffiseth may. I can't decide, you decide. So what is he doing? Giving He's giving her the power, exactly. He's giving her the power. What do women want most of all? They want the mastery. They want the mastery in marriage. That's what he is turning over to her. She says, you choose how you want me to be. You see, old and unattractive, but a great wife in every other way to you. Or young and beautiful, but you may not get a very good wife. You can't even count on my being faithful to you. And of course, here he's going, oh God, you know, I can't decide. You decide for the two of us. Not just for himself, but you decide for the two of us. What's going to do you the most honor as well as me the most honor? So that both of us gain. Not just me, but both of us gain. And of course, Than have get of you mestria? Quod she, have I gotten the mastery over you? Sin e may chase and govern as may last? Yes, seritus weave, quod he, he hold it best. Kiss me! Kiss me, quod she. We be no langer rotha. For be me truth, he will be to you both. This is to saying, yeah, both fair and good. I'll be both beautiful and faithful 
to you. He pray to God that he mot sterven woad, but he to you be also good and true, that ever was we've sin that the world was newer. And but ye be to morn as fair to sane as any laddy, empress or quena, that is betwixt the east and eke the west, do with me leaf and death reeked as yo least. Cast up the curtain, look how that it is. And of course, you know, you've probably seen these. They used to have uh, curtains that would come around the bed and you could draw the curtains or close the curtains. That's because you know, the rooms tended to be very drafty. And uh, unless you were going to catch cold, you know, you would want to cut off the drafts by having these curtains. So uh, apparently he's, you know, still on the other side of the curtain. And she says, pull back the curtain and take a look. And one the Kanik saw verily all this, that she so fair was and young thereto, for joy a hand here in his arm as twa, his hair to bothered in a bath of bliss. A thousand team arwa he gone here kissa, and she obeyed him in everything that meeked do him pleasance or leaking. On this and thus they leave unto their leavers and uh, in perfect joy on Jesu Christ or sender whose bonders make uh, young and fresh a better and grasped over be to him that way wedder and eke pray Jesu short here leavers that nuked wall be gervened be here weavers and old and angry negarders of dispensa, and God send him son a very pestilenza. So what happens, apparently, is he turns over the mastery to her, and then she says, not only now am I going to be young and beautiful and faithful to you, but I'll do anything you like, because you have turned over the mastery to me. This is the magic key. Well, okay. And then, of course, you know, the, the wife of Baath, because after all, she's telling the story, right? She says, oh boy, would, would that all husbands could be like this, you know, and, and young and compliant and good in bed and, you know, uh, just <laughs> terrific, just terrific guys. Uh, and this, of course, is her definition of a, of a terrific guy. Uh, and then, you know, for other kinds of husbands, you know, who are overbearing and whatnot, you know, uh, let's hope that God will shorten their lives. Well, it happens, by the way, and I'm just departing from this story just for a moment, but this is an interesting little sidelight, that there was a saint who was celebrated uh, at various places in England and also on the continent in Northern Europe, who had various names. But one of the names that she went by in England was Saint Uncumber. And according to legend, Saint Uncumber, who also has other names, as I mentioned elsewhere, uh, was a princess who had made a prayer to the Virgin Mary that she would never give up her virginity herself. And her father, the king, said, uh, 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 you are going to have to marry this prince from another country because this is too important to both of our countries not to go through with this. And so she prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed that somehow or another she not be forced into the marriage. And so, the wedding day comes, she's in the church, she's still praying away, you know, for some kind of miracle that she will be released from this marriage. And uh, the marriage ceremony takes place. She is taken by the other women to the marriage bed and she's laid down there and in comes the prince and he parts the curtains and she's still praying away for a miracle uh, to deliver her even at the last moment and he pulls apart the bed curtains, and there she is with this very long, curling, luxurious beard 
that has miraculously just grown, by the way. Well, of course, he jumps back and says, oh my God, you know, I can't, you know, possibly be married to this person. And see, the marriage is not consummated, right? So therefore, it's not a marriage. And uh, so uh, this obviously is a sign from God that the marriage is not intended to be. Well, uh, there are, by the way, statues to St. Uncumber in some places in England and some places in Northern Europe in which you will see, and you know, you've probably seen pictures like this, where on a column or next to a column in one of the medieval cathedrals, there will be an upright figure, and it could be one of the saints, let's say. In this case, it's a fem obviously a female saint, but with a big beard. Well, this is, she's elsewhere called Wilgefort, by the way, but anyway, she's here, uh, she's Saint Uncumber. And apparently women would go and pray to Saint Uncumber. Uh, and one of the prayers apparently went something like this. If your husband's at you, won't let you slumber, then you should pray to Saint Uncumber. And what you were praying to St. Uncumber for was an early and happy death for your husband. So, <laughs> so that's the sort of thing that, that the wife of Beth is saying here, where she's saying, you know, and please God, you know, give short lives to bad husbands. So that, their, so that their wives can be released as soon as possible from the bondage of a bad husband. Well, OK, as the wife of Bath now has finished her prologue, which is a long autobiographical piece, and now her tale, the clerk is sitting there. And the clerk apparently, this is according to Kittredge's theory, the clerk apparently is fuming. And the clerk decides that he is going to tell a tale, no, no, no big surprise, as the clerk's tale, about uh, this man named Walter, who's a nobleman in the north of Italy, who decides, first of all, that he doesn't want to get married because he's having too much fun as a single guy. Uh, but then the people come to him and they say, oh, no, 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 enough is enough. You know, you have to get married because it is your responsibility to provide us with an heir. So he doesn't want to do it, but he says, okay, but I'm going to marry whomever I want to. And they say, okay, 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 just so long as you get married and provide us with an heir. Because then you would have a succession of the rulership of the duchy. So, he marries the daughter of the poorest man in the land, a woman named Griselda. And so, she is brought to his palace. They are married. They have two children. They're living this wonderful life together. He, at one point, even goes off to the wars. She's left in charge, does a beautiful job of ruling over the land while he is gone. And then he comes back and he decides that he's going to test her. So his first test is that their daughter is taken away and her daughter is killed. And how is she going to react to that? And so she reacts by saying, Whatever you do must be right, my dear husband. And so she has passed his first test. Well, then after a while, he has their son taken off and says that the son has been killed. Once again, she replies, whatever you say, you know, all is for the best, my dear husband. And so then another while passes. And in the meantime, the daughter and the son are beginning to grow up. They're not adults yet, but they're beginning to grow up. And the, uh, and the daughter now is a teenager. And so he announces to his wife, Griselda, that he's going to put her away and he is going to marry a young wife. 
And she says, whatever you say, dear, that's fine. And I will assist in the preparation for the bride of the proper gowns and the feast and uh, help out with the wedding preparations for your new wife. And so they even have, you know, the, this young, pretty young girl and, and her young brother, who actually are the children of the two of them. They were never really killed. Um, come, and at the last moment when the wedding is supposed to be taking place, Walter, the husband, says, oh, this is all really a trick. You know, and this is your daughter, and this is your son. They haven't been killed after all, and I'm not going to marry this girl, but you are my lady love, and he embraces her, and according to the clerk, they then are going to live happily ever after. Well, it would appear here that the clerk's tale in response to the wife's is about a woman who uh, has a, an ultimately happy marriage because she gives over the mastery totally to her husband, even under the most extreme circumstances. Well, um, you can imagine how most modern readers, especially most modern uh, women, well, men readers too, respond to, uh, to that story. Except that the clerk goes on and he says, you know, and he makes a sidelong reference to the wife of Bath, and he says, you know, I didn't really intend that wives should be like Griselda, that this is really a kind of allegory about how Christians should behave in relation to God. But nevertheless, it is about a man and a woman, a husband and a wife. Well, okay, we go on. We have the merchant's tale, which I told you one time before, is an elaborate tale of, of sexual tricks and deceptions uh, in which an old man marries a very young woman. I mean, there are like 40 to 50 years between the two of them. And, um, you know, that was only possible because of the dowry system and the paying of dowries and the exchange of monies between families and so forth that would take place, making it possible for someone who had a sufficient amount of money actually to negotiate for a young wife. So that's how that kind of thing could happen. Um, I'm told by my colleague Sally Vaughn, a professor in the history department as a medieval historian, that actually then when the, the husbands died off, then there would be these young or relatively young women who would now be in control of all this property, and then they would get to choose whom they would marry as their next husband. Well, uh, you know, uh, Dr. Vaughn certainly knows a great deal more about it than I do, but, but in Chaucer at any rate, what happens is that we have this elaborate story of infidelity and deception which provides us with a very cynical view of marriage. And according to Kittredge, this whole marriage group is dramatically, remember the dramatic principle, resolved with the Franklin's tale, which I'm going to tell you about at the beginning of our next segment, in which, according to Kittredge, we have an egalitarian view of marriage in which husband and wife treat one another as equals and share equally in the mastery of the marriage.